right, good afternoon, let's get started. So today we're gonna uh, talk about a particularly advanced kind of an isolation mechanism, enclaves, which is the paper you guys read for this lecture. And uh, this is gonna be sort of the last uh, lecture in our study of various plans to isolate uh, untrustworthy or potentially malicious code in a computer system. And uh, the reason we're reading this paper is that there are sort of cool things going on in this enclave uh, machinery that's provided to, to us. Um, sort of these enclaves came about fairly recently, you know, five-ish years ago when uh, Intel came out with support for enclaves in their CPUs in a feature called SGX, Software Guard Extensions. And I've got a bunch of people excited about enclaves, uh, or more so than they were before, anyway. Um, and uh, you can sort of see this paper is a fairly recent paper. It was published uh, two years ago. Uh, not maybe uh, sort of fully understandable for you guys, especially the verification parts of it, but hopefully it gives you a sense of what's going on in the space of uh, enclaves, and we'll go over it in this lecture. Uh, if you guys have questions, ask. Uh, this is a bit of a confusing paper, I'm sure. It didn't define all the terms up front, uh, but we'll try to work this out in lecture and see what, what are they talking about. So, with that said, sort of the cool things uh, in this paper, uh, this Komodo system, uh, it's really trying to provide an alternative way of building enclaves, which sort of this lecture will explain as well, uh, to Intel SGX doing all of this in Intel CPU hardware and microcode. And what these enclaves end up being are really an isolation mechanism, which uh, you've seen a lot of these before. Uh, so native client, operating systems, containers, virtual machines, these are all ways to box in code. This is gonna be yet another way to build a box, and it's gonna be perhaps stronger and better than some of the previous mechanisms we've seen. And there's another sort of angle to this whole story of attestation, and we'll talk about this as well, uh, that is particularly useful when trying to talk to a box over a network. So we'll see what this is as well. And as you probably sort of saw in this paper, these guys are really going after a very strong threat model. And this is uh, one of the things that gets people excited about enclaves is that they're really trying to tackle this problem when the operating system is not even trustworthy. You don't want to trust the OS on your computer. And this turns out to be a pretty powerful idea that captures a whole bunch of real attacks that you might want to worry about and protect yourself from. And sort of the last exciting thing is that this gives you like a sense of uh, this cutting edge technology. Um, this is where sort of the state of the art is of, of building strong boxes is and verifying them and making sure they're correct. Uh, so hopefully it gives you a little bit of a sense of where things stand in the research space. Now, I should say, many of you guys were wondering, what is this Komodo thing, where can I use it, how do I run this? So this is really a paper, right? So these guys are not trying to build a product. Komodo is not a thing that you download and run on your computer. These guys are really researchers trying to argue for a different way that you should build these enclave things that we, uh, we are, we're gonna talk about. Uh, so Komodo is really sort of meant to illustrate that, oh, well, this, this could work, and that maybe Intel or others should think about this alternative approach to building their enclave boxes instead of shoving it all into their hardware CPU. Um, so it's really sort of a proof of concept rather than a product, and all these limitations that they talk about, are sort of interesting to keep in mind, but sort of not the end of the world if the limitations are sort of orthogonal to their main point. So hopefully that sets at least some context of what this paper is trying to uh, argue for, uh, for the readers. Make sense? Questions-ish? All right. So, Maybe to set the context to understand what these enclaves are and what they're trying to provide, let's contrast this with the traditional story of isolation that we've seen before in the case of an operating system process. So an operating system process is also a box that allows us to run multiple things on a single computer in isolation from one another. And the story relies quite a bit on having an OS kernel here whose job is to sit below all the processes that might be running on the operating system, process two, process one, et cetera. And the kernel's job is to interpose sort of between the processes running on the underlying you know, CPU over here and storing some data probably in memory. And the way the kernel works in Linux and pretty much every operating system is that in order to keep these processes separate from one another, the kernel sets up page tables. So a page table is gonna be a mapping describing the virtual address space that's reachable by one of these processes. That's what's gonna box them in. 
So a process is only going to be able to refer to virtual addresses to memory defined in this page table. So in this example, maybe process one has a page table that only lets it access this range of real memory in hardware. And this other process runs with a different page table that only lets it access a different range of physical memory over here. So this might be familiar from 033 or other lectures. Uh, and this is the sort of setup for an operating system kernel. That's how it keeps the processes apart. And then if the processes need something more than accessing memory, they are going to issue system calls. So a system call is going to allow a process to talk to the OS kernel and get the kernel to do something for it, maybe allocate more memory, maybe start a process, access files, and so on. And the security of this whole scheme depends hugely on this operating system kernel. This thing better be correct in many ways. Better set up these page tables correctly so that the page tables don't overlap and don't give these processes in a box access to memory they shouldn't be able to access. And all these system call implementations better be correct and only allow things that are sensible to allow for that process and don't have other bugs, et cetera. So that's sort of the setup for traditional OS isolation that you guys have seen probably but it's good to sort of remind ourselves what the picture looks like so that we can talk about what our enclave's trying to solve in this picture. Any questions about the OS story so far? What are we talking about there? All right. So, so what are these enclaves trying to achieve? What are they going for? So the really big goal here is to deal with a compromised OS. or more specifically in this picture, a compromised kernel that can't be relied upon to provide isolation anymore. So this is a reasonable threat model. Should we worry about a compromised kernel? Seems like we had a perfectly good plan that assumed the kernel was good. Yeah, that's probably better than a lot of software. <laughs> How much should we worry about it? Yeah, you're sort of, you know, here or there. Okay, so another way to think of it is, this is a particular assumption. Are there real things that lead to your OS being compromised? So well, well, how would your OS get compromised? Yeah? Yeah, okay, so one way is it sort of depends on from whose perspective is it compromised. Maybe you compromise your own OS. So if, if, if you're trying to run some software that doesn't trust you, the user, well, they might not trust your OS either because you installed your OS. And in that case, uh, maybe the user just, you know, can choose whatever, whatever they want to run in the OS. And depending on the setup here, like for DRM, when you're trying to watch some movie from online and the server doesn't want to give you the movie file, it only wants to let you watch it, not copy it. Well, that's a situation where that server doesn't trust your OS because they don't trust you. That seems a little less historic. Like, I, I should say, that's like one of the actually big motivations that historically drove some of this technology. Uh, but are there more exciting reasons why my, your OS might be compromised that you might care about yourself? Yeah. Lab service. Yeah, so it might be that, yeah, so as a user or basically like operator. Uh, so if you're using some server in the cloud, um, you know, it would be cool if I don't have to trust the guy running the installing Linux and maintaining all these virtual machines on the cloud server. Yeah, so that'll be cool. Other situations, like on my laptop. Should I trust my OS? Not a cloud server, I installed it. Yeah. Booting, uh, so you could just boot into uh, a different. Yeah, so it might be that someone, I guess, like physically steals my laptop and reinstalls the OS or something. Plausible, yeah, so maybe physical attacks. Anything else should I should worry about? Yeah. Sure, themselves compromised OS. Yeah, could be. Yeah, I guess physical attacks. They maybe before I got the computer, even the whole bootloader is screwed up. These are all kind of hysteric. Like I think the, the biggest problem uh, I want to sort of po point out is just like malware. So you accidentally download some program and run it on your computer, and uh, like in Windows or even in Linux to a large degree, you're going to download some software from the internet and run it. If it's not in JavaScript and not in a sandbox, you're just going to run it directly on your operating system with rather full access to your OS kernel. Uh, and that game or program you downloaded from the internet and ran directly on your computer 
could just take over your computer. There's very little sandboxing going on in Windows and Linux for sort of software that natively runs on your computer if you're not using fancy stuff like native client. I think this is the biggest problem in practice of why people have compromised OS is they just like accidentally downloaded malicious software and ran it. And uh, that means even if I don't have an enemy at a hardware manufacturer, just maybe like I am made a mistake. Or sort of maybe another way to think of it, even if you don't make mistakes, there might be just bugs in the OS. Or another privileged software you're running on your computer. So bugs come back, come back again. That's sort of the reason why our computers aren't trustworthy, even to me as a user, even let alone this like complicated DRM story. Make sense? So that's sort of the motivation, or sort of the more exciting motivation for the Sunclave machinery is that even if I have a computer running an old version of Windows that got broken into and compromised and uh, running malware, maybe there's some hope for me for getting something useful done. That would be really cool. And what these guys are really trying to provide is sort of a not sort of complete uh, protection from this uh, compromised OS. So they really want to provide in Enclaves a way to keep secrets or protect con sensitive data. And in particular, I want to contrast this not availability. So this enclave box that we're going to be drawing is going to really protect some secret stuff inside the box and make sure the OS doesn't get to it. But we're not going to be trying to make sure that this box keeps running if your OS is bad. So if, if your OS is compromised, then it can probably just like power off your computer and not let you get anything done or refuse to run or other issues like that. But uh, what we're going to really aim for is to make sure secrets, like in important data, doesn't leak out of our enclave box. Make sense, sort of? Questions? All right. So let me try to sort of explain what this enclave abstraction is. We'll sort of, you know, iterate on this, I'm sure, and you should ask questions. But here's sort of one way to think of what, a, what is an enclave. Where does that fit in the world? Um, so I think a convenient way to think of it is that you got your computer, and you got your memory, you know, underneath of all your stuff, and you have your OS kernel running here. Logically, the way to think of it is that these enclaves are going to run outside the kernel's control. So previously, we were imagining the kernel is controlling your whole computer and all of memory. And in this enclave world, what's going to happen is that you're going to have your kernel running your regular processes on top of it, no problem. But then side by side, you're going to have this enclave running here that is not directly controlled by the kernel. And the kernel doesn't get to poke arbitrarily at the enclave's memory. Somehow, we're going to sort of split up the memory of the machine, and the enclave could touch some memory here in this secure portion, like Komodo talks about, and probably some portions here. But the kernel and the regular processes running on top of it can only touch this regular kernel memory, or memory managed by the regular kernel. So that's the kind of abstraction that the enclave is trying to provide as a way to spawn processes outside of the kernel's control. And I think the goal for many of these enclave abstractions is to make it fairly easy to spawn one of these enclaves. It's not supposed to be, or at least in many designs, it's not supposed to be a heavyweight thing like a whole virtual machine. It should be like spawning a process. So you can easily spawn one at runtime, you could spawn a bunch of them, you could uh, do it quickly over time, et cetera. So that's the isolation story of this enclave abstraction that we're going to try to provide, or Komodo tries to provide. And the other part of the story, so I guess that's, that's the isolation. And the other thing that I mentioned up front up there is this notion of attestation. So what attestation is, is a way for other users outside of this computer or outside of the enclave to understand what's running in this enclave. And the reason this is important is that if you trust your OS kernel, you can, for the most part, trust the OS kernel starts the right thing. You asked it to start a process, it started that process. You ran a particular, you, you like compiled a certain program, ran that binary, that's what's running. You're trusting the kernel to do this. In the enclave world, we're going to be not trusting the kernel to start the right enclave. 
but the kernel is able to start enclaves. We're gonna, that's how the system is gonna work out. So it turns out to be important to figure out what is actually running after the fact. Did we get the right enclave running or not? Should I trust it to do the right thing? Or did the kernel spawn another enclave over here, also in a very good box, but just running the wrong code? I shouldn't trust this guy. Maybe it's in a nice box, but it's not gonna do what I want. So this attestation story is gonna allow some client outside talking to the enclave to get some idea about what's actually running in that enclave box and then make a decision as to whether it wants to trust that enclave or not with some data that it might send there. Make sense? So that's, I think, what, they're, what these guys are trying to achieve in their design. Questions about that? Yeah? So by isolation, do you mean isolation of processes? Or no. no, basically the way to think of the Sunclave world is we are gonna give up on this part of the world. This is just so broken, we're not gonna fix it. It's hopeless. This thing is like 10 million lines of code. There's bugs, malware, bad stuff running there. We don't know what the hell's going on there. Our only hope is to make new nice small boxes over here on the side. So processes are gone. Or they're not gone, they're running there. They are gonna allow in the Sunclave world for you to keep running your existing software. But the hope and sort of the plan for how to use this stuff is let's try to factor out the really important stuff and put them into these enclave boxes outside of the OS. They might be kind of clunky because they don't have an OS that they can assume is working there. They can't just use a regular file system, all kinds of things. There are gonna be restrictions on these enclave boxes. But they're gonna be well isolated. So it's sort of up to you as a trade-off. What do you wanna stick in this strongly isolated box that's gonna make your overall system's life better? Make sense? Other questions? All right. So, before we dive into the details of enclaves, I wanna point out that people have been struggling with this problem of compromised OSs for a long time. And there's a number of things people have tried to do before this most recent wave of enclave excitement, uh, sort of fueled by Intel SGX. And there's basically three general classes of previous approaches for what to do about compromised operating systems. So one of them, someone already sort of in indirectly mentioned, which is um, what showed up in uh, the system called the Trusted Platform Module, or uh, an idea called Secure Boot, which is, well, we're gonna deal with compromised OSs by basically checking what, the, what kernel boots. So what I mean by this is that when your computer boots up, it's gonna check what kernel am I about to run. And then it's either gonna record that or it's gonna check that the kernel must only be the one that Apple or Microsoft or someone signed and must be a good kernel. So this whole plan for basically making sure the right kernel is running, sort of a weaker form of this plan for dealing with a compromised OS by really looking at fairly restricted classes of why the OS might be compromised because someone just installed a different OS. So a big part of the motivation for this, or one motivation was sort of DRM, where uh, as uh, was pointed out earlier on, you might have a situation where I wanna play a movie, but the movie studio server doesn't wanna send me the movie file because they worry I have a funny OS that's gonna save a copy of the movie. And this TPM secure boot plan sort of helps them deal with this problem by making sure that my computer can only run the approved Windows kernel or whatever kernel is okay, that's not gonna let me do this. Um, so that's one way to deal with compromised OS kernels of a certain sort of flavor of attack is by checking them up front. This sort of, you know, does something, but uh, doesn't really deal with a whole bunch of other attacks, right? So like if I have malware or bugs in the OS, physical attacks, all these things don't really help. It's really all about making sure I don't under install Linux to pirate a movie. So the other sort of thing that's uh, shown up recently is uh, just using a separate CPU. So if you really wanna build a box like this that's independent of the OS kernel, maybe you just have a separate CPU, like a little separate computer on the side, <laughs> running its own thing, running the enclave. This is what actually a bunch of smartphones do. So Apple iPhones, many Android phones, actually have a separate chip inside of them whose job is to run some really sensitive operations like 
unlocking the device for the user, checking the user's PIN, managing their cryptographic keys, et cetera. It's a pretty good idea if you have a really important thing you wanna stick on a separate CPU, but the downsides, as you can imagine, is that you know, there's some cost involved for a separate CPU, and it's actually not super flexible, because if I wanna have another application that wants a strongly isolated environment, well, maybe I'll need a separate CPU again. So I'll need a whole bunch of CPUs if I have a bunch of applications. Or we're gonna put them all in the same CPU and then we have the same problem as before. They are not isolated from one another. So this is a good idea for sort of singularly important things, like on a smartphone. Apple does this, Android does this, but not so satisfactory if you wanna allow arbitrary applications to benefit from a stronger isolation plan. Make sense? All right. And the last thing, sort of the closest thing that people have done prior to enclaves is to really use hypervisors or virtual machines. So instead of running the kernel directly on the hardware, let's stick a virtual machine monitor underneath of it, and then the virtual machine monitor can keep the kernel separate from other virtual machines running on the same computer. And that might actually let us have a, some way of dealing with an OS kernel that's compromised. So why not virtual machines? Why not hypervisors? Seems like a potential answer to our requirements. Yeah. 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 There's some performance overhead, um, but modern virtual machine monitors are pretty good. You can even, yeah, run on laptops, I imagine. Any others, like, would you trust a virtual machine monitor to do this for you? It depends on how much you care. So one problem with virtual machine monitors is that they're still pretty complicated pieces of software, and the virtual machines that they run are oftentimes heavyweight and are not like forking a process in Unix that you could just fork off a new virtual machine whenever you feel like it. And uh, the virtual machine monitor itself is probably millions of lines of code, very much like the Linux kernel. It probably is the Linux kernel with KVM running on top of it. So it might not be that much more secure than a full OS kernel. Depends on how you cut it. At least it doesn't accept system calls probably. But uh, still, a rather complex piece of software maybe not nearly as strong as a separate CPU plan. So could we get closer to a strong level of isolation without having to buy out separate ch chips for every enclave we wanna run? All right, so that's sort of the context for this whole enclave uh, story. So the way these enclaves are gonna work, so both in SGX, this is the Intel hardware thing, and the Komodo system that you guys read about in today's paper, the way they're gonna work is to slip some kind of a monitor between the hardware and the OS kernel. So the plan is gonna be we have our memory here at the bottom, we have our kernel up top, and we're gonna be running some kind of a monitor whose job is to keep the kernel from arbitrary accessing all memory, and we're gonna divide up the memory, very much like I was drawing there, into a part reserved for enclaves and a part reserved for the regular world with the compromised OS kernel. So the job of this monitor is gonna be to sort of both let the OS kernel run as it normally would, so you have a still functioning computer doing everything it used to do, and allow you to run these little enclaves on the side over here in a way that the kernel can't get to. So as far as the diagram goes, this looks a lot like just having a virtual machine monitor, and these guys are virtual machines. But the main sort of story for these enclaves is really focused on what's the minimal amount of functionality we need to stick into this monitor so that it's actually trustworthy, so that it doesn't have bugs, doesn't have all the sort of lines of code that might lead to it being compromised, and as a result, we might be able to trust it much more than sort of another layer of an OS kernel or a hypervisor uh, isolating these pieces from one another. Make sense? So what, so what are we gonna assume is sort of malicious in this case? Well, certainly the kernel and the processes running on top of the kernel 
the threat model basically says these guys are malicious. We should assume these guys might be trying to get our enclaves and trying to compromise them. Um, depending on the threat model, and in, in, in SGX in particular, um, these guys also worry about the user or someone trying to physically access the DRAM. So maybe take the DRAM chips out of your server and like plug them into a different computer and read out the DRAM before it gets a chance to decay. Uh, so fairly sophisticated attacks even. Um, so about the only thing that's going to be trusted for this uh, setup of SGX or Komodo is going to be the CPU that's running uh, all the software. You have to trust the CPU, otherwise the whole plan is out the window, and this thin monitor. So this guy is trusted. But everything else is going to be potentially compromised. The kernel's bad, processes are bad, the memory might be observable to the bad guy. Only the monitor and the CPU are good for you. And even the enclaves, you want to make sure that you don't tr trust them fully. So the monitor is going to guarantee to the enclaves that they're running in isolation. But it's not going to trust that the enclaves are good, because anyone can start an enclave. The OS kernel can start an enclave if it wants. So it's important that these enclaves are also isolated from one another. So if you run multiple enclaves, one of them can compromise the other. Make sense? What the setup is? All right. So let's look at, so, so Komodo, I should say, I guess, uh, returning to this whole context, right? Like, so Intel SGX is this uh, thing that Intel CPUs have been shipping with for the last five-ish years, where this monitor is kind of baked into the CPU itself. So there's no explicit software that you have to install to run SGX. It's that this SGX monitor is implemented in hardware itself, largely in microcode that the CPU is gonna execute at runtime. But there's basically a lot of special instructions that the CPU supports in order to perform these monitor operations. So Intel SGX is this sort of monolithic plan to stick this monitor into the CPU itself. And what the Komodo guys are trying to argue for is that it's good to really disentangle this thing because SGX is a fairly complicated design and uh, Intel has been iterating on it for a little while there's been some issues found, people keep finding more things, they worry about different issues, they might wanna change how this isolation works a bit, but because it's baked into the hardware, it's kind of slow to change and only Intel can change it. So this paper is a bit of a reaction to that where these guys wanna argue that, well, the hardware should provide some things in order to allow these enclave things to be built, but wouldn't it be cool if we can figure out what's the minimal amount of stuff the hardware needs to give us and then do everything else on top in software? And then it's much more flexible, maybe you can have more confidence, it's open, easy to change, to fix if need be, and uh, we have a better understanding of how this whole thing is put together. That's the story for this Komodo design. So one thing we can try to look at is what are these guys arguing is actually needed from the underlying hardware in order to realize a picture like this, where you can actually have enclaves is isolated from the OS kernel. So of course you could do hypervisors and VMs like we were talking about, but the thinking here is, let's try to figure out the minimum amount of stuff that the hardware needs to provide to us so that we can pull this off with both maybe a low performance overhead as well as low complexity in this monitor so that it might actually be bug free. Make sense? Questions? All right. So, so these guys actually have a whole sort of discussion in the paper about um, what they need. And the first thing, of course, is they need some notion of an isolated memory. So the picture to have in mind is that you got your memory over here that is actually gonna store all your data in the system. And there's many things in the computer talking to it. So for example, you got your CPU sitting on top of it, talking to your memory. And this thing is running the OS kernel and other things on top of the kernel. Um, and our job is gonna be to divvy up sort of a chunk of this memory that only enclaves and the monitor can get to. The kernel shouldn't be able to get to it or the attacker shouldn't be able to get to this shaded box, shaded portion of memory. So how are we gonna do this? Well, for the CPU, it's relatively easy. Um, relatively speaking, uh, well, it depends on what this, your CPU provides, but at least for the kernel code running on the CPU, you might imagine doing this by having the CPU help you out. So the CPU might know that it's running the kernel, in which case it's not gonna allow accessing 
things in this shaded region of memory. So we need some special support for the CPU for some kind of access control to physical memory, depending on what's actually executing right now. But then the CPU could actually be in charge of controlling when this sensitive secure memory is accessible and when it's not. So what are other things we should worry about on a computer system? What else could get to our memory? What are they worried about? Yeah. Just so like a network adapter. Yeah, so if you have like a NIC or something or your graphics card or any other kind of a device, right, they're sitting on some kind of a PCI bus probably. Well, depends on your computer, right? And this PCI bus is wired to some kind of a controller that lets it directly access memory, not going through the CPU. Now, the thing that makes this tricky now is that the kernel is gonna be in charge still of controlling all of our devices. It's got all the device drivers for your gigabit network card and for your flash storage controller and for your graphics card, all this stuff. So the kernel might not be able to directly poke your memory through the CPU, but it could program the NIC and tell it, hey, you know, go right to this memory or read from it. So that'd be problematic. How do these guys plan to deal with this? How could you deal with this? Is a hole in their plan? Yeah. <laughs> Sir? Yeah. yeah, so one actually nice end-to-end uh, -end solution, if you will, is to just encrypt everything in memory. You have to encrypt and probably authenticate it as well to make sure that it's not corrupted, but if you manage to authenticate and encrypt the data in memory, then you get protection from almost any kind of an attack on physical storage uh, for free. Well, for the overhead of encryption and authentication. Uh, but these guys actually don't encrypt in this paper. What do you do? Yeah. Hash. No, so like hashing wouldn't really help, especially if you're worried about keeping this data secret because you know, you gotta get your data back, so you can't just store the hash, you gotta store the real thing somewhere too. So hash might prevent corruption, for sure, uh, if you can keep the hash secure, uh, but it's not gonna keep the data secret. How do these guys propose to deal with protecting memory from these devices, if at all? Yeah? Uh, you could store the memory on chip. Yeah, yeah. So one actually thing is maybe there should be multiple pieces of memory, right? So like, one is maybe the secure memory should just be wired up directly to the CPU. And this might be a little bit crazy on like an x86 server or something like this or a laptop, but on an ARM machine, it's fairly common to have these complicated system on chip designs where there's lots of different memories, lots of different processors, lots of different buses. So this might be actually a viable plan for something like a smartphone with a custom ARM SOC chip. And this looks a little bit actually like what Apple does. Like Monday's lecture is gonna be all about the internals of iPhones and how they work. Uh, but that, that, this is plausible. Yeah? Why is it plausible in ARM devices and not x86? Um, it's not so much the instruction set itself, but I think the architecture of, so the CPUs are standardized. ARM CPUs, x86 CPUs, they're basically like black boxes. What's going on is that on x86, the platform around the CPU is quite standard. Like there's a standard memory controller, there's a single bus that has all your memory, there's a standard way to do interprocessor interrupts. All the stuff is basically wired down. Different motherboard manufacturers don't have a different plan for where you find your DRAM. That's all the same. The PCI devices sit pretty much in a standard plan, place. On ARM devices, because they came out of this embedded device uh, sort of historically world, uh, it's much more common for each device manufacturer to wire up this black box CPU to peripherals in completely crazy different ways. And this is sort of proliferated onto the current, you know, smartphones and so on, where you have all these accelerators, cameras, sensors, et cetera, and they're not all PCI devices, which is like, on your PC, they would just be like PCI or USB devices. On a smartphone or an ARM SOC, you probably have all kinds of specialized buses that are for power efficiency. You might have special cores here and there, special memory that's only accessible to this chip and not this other chip. Just somehow the convention for that platform is such that much more acceptable. And the software, like Linux kernel on ARM, sort of expects to have, to be told, like here's a crazy, you know, <laughs> motherboard layout you're running on, and not as much on x86, yeah. So that's where that's coming from. Um, so, in terms of how to deal with these devices accessing memory directly, um, 
sort of uh, two answers. One is, like the most direct thing, these guys implementation-wise, it's a little bit disappointing. They don't actually have a plan for this. Actually, they don't even have a plan for the CPU isolation. They kind of run their prototype on a Raspberry Pi, which doesn't isolate anything. And they say, well, you know, performance is the same, so we'll just run this and uh, report some numbers. Uh, but their actual prototype on a Raspberry Pi doesn't actually even isolate on the CPU. A little bit disappointing. Uh, but I guess their argument is that if the CPU allowed this, wouldn't have made a difference. We would just flip that one bit to allow the CPU to filter addresses, and then everything would have been the same from then on because we don't have any attacks going on. Um, so that's sort of the, what they actually did. But their story for what you might imagine actually happening is that they're hoping that there might be a device in here that's usually called an IOMMU, which you can sort of think of it as a way to stick a page table in front of these devices. So without an IOMU or without a page table, when you access an address in memory, it goes directly to that memory location in your DRAM. And with a page table, this allows an OS kernel traditionally to control what addresses processes can access uh, by remapping them through a page table. And a whole bunch of uh, machines nowadays, x86 and even ARM, have some form of an IOMU device that lets you interpose on the addresses supplied by these DMA-capable devices and control, as a result, what memory they can access. So for Komodo, they're sort of thinking, well, if you're not gonna encrypt the memory, then you could rely on a device like this that's gonna interpose on the memory accesses by these DMA devices and protect your secure memory that way. So that's their sort of at least design level story for what to do about device memory accesses. And the final story, as uh, you were pointing out, is that you know, maybe we have physical access, in which case the only real answer for how to deal with that is to get the CPU to encrypt all this data. So what this would mean is that if you wanna deal with attacks where the bad guy, who might be the owner of the device is the bad guy, depending on who you are, um, the bad guy is gonna just directly somehow manipulate the DRAM chips in your computer and extract data that way. So if, you, if the goal is to deal with that, then you need to get your CPU to have some kind of a memory encryption engine where you might actually encrypt the data going out and then decrypt it and authenticate that it's still correct coming back into the CPU. So this is what actually, okay, so, so for Komodo, what these guys say, well, we want the CPU to just do filtering of addresses and we hope there's an IMU-like thing on the side. Their prototype doesn't actually have either one, but that's their design anyway. And then Intel's GX, the thing that's implemented in the hardware in Intel chips, actually does this encryption and decryption on all memory going out to, to DRAM. An interesting actually benefit of encrypting memory is that at least on x86 or high performance machines, DRAM itself is like a complicated device. So there's actually a lot of control registers for the DRAM controller that the OS can set. So the OS can program how fast the DRAM refreshes, which DRAM banks get rid of at different times and so on. And if the OS is malicious, it could misconfigure the DRAM controller itself and just corrupt the whole notion of memory in the first place, like the bits decay or who knows what. So in order to not worry about these attacks of the OS actually misconfiguring the memory controller, SGX, I think in part, relies on encryption and decryption that lets them not worry about this nearly as much. Make sense? So that's sort of the two approaches taking to uh, provide isolated memory in SGX and in this Komodo design that the paper talks about. Questions about this memory isolation plan these guys are talking about? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, here, this box that is supposed to isolate addresses, it's an input-output memory management unit. That's the sort of thing you can Google if you wanted. Uh, yeah. Yeah, question. Is the box that the CPU is secure memory? Um, yeah, so here we were imagining an alternative design where maybe instead of trying to separate a single memory into a secure and insecure portions, we were speculating that maybe another approach to achieve isolated memory might be just to like have a separate memory on the side, I guess secure memory, sure, let's call it, uh, that for some reason is only accessible from the CPU, not from devices, or maybe, maybe it's actually even part of the CPU piece of silicon, or in the same physical package, so that you can't even debug it without breaking your whole CPU, at which point the whole thing is broken. Uh, if you manufacture your 
plastic CPU package in a very tamper-proof way. Yeah, well, you know, Komodo is kind of a weird design, right? Like these guys, they're kind of nowhere, like the real thing they build doesn't actually have isolated memory, which is a little bit embarrassing. So they're basically saying they have a design that will be compatible with all kinds of plans like this. So you could have this plan, you could have this plan, you could have encryption, you could have CPU isolation and IMU, all good stuff compatible with their design, but they actually run on a Raspberry Pi that has none of this. Um, so that, that's sort of what the papers, is. and okay, so admittedly, I think this is maybe not a horrible thing because, I, you know, I'm, at least for me, I'm probably convinced that the, their argument that the performance would probably be the same if they stuck an IMU more or less and actually had the CPU filter out which memory accesses go from the kernel versus not. Um, and a large part of the paper's you know, technical work was on verifying the correctness of this uh, monitor implementation, which uh, sort of a complicated story that probably we can't get into in this class in much detail, but uh, I think the authors are really excited about that part of the work, which is why they're thinking, well, that's like a small detail, even though important in practice. <laughs> you can sort of see, right, like this is extremely a research prototype. This is not a thing you would actually like go and run. Uh, but they're really trying to change the mind of people that are just gonna design the next SGX-like thing to do it in this style rather than the everything in hardware style, perhaps. Other questions? All right, so we need isolated memory of some sort in order to make this picture fly. Um, the other thing that we really need is different ways to execute code on a CPU, so different execution modes. If we don't have a way to execute code with different privileges, then we might have trouble keeping all these components separate from one another. And in particular, the three sort of contexts that we care about are gonna be this OS kernel, that's just untrusted and should be in its own little cage. Then we have the monitor, that's kind of omni-powerful, should have access to the whole computer, do whatever it needs to be done. And then we have these enclaves that are in some ways you know, maybe more privileged than the kernel because they can access their enclave memory, which the kernel cannot, but also less privileged than the kernel because the kernel can access all these devices and the enclaves cannot. So there's these three sort of levels of privilege, if you will, uh, that have to be realized on the machine somehow. So one way to sort of draw this out, I basically have the same diagram I'm drawing for you guys over and over because it's all about who can access, access which memory. Um, so what we're gonna need is, uh, we got our memory at the bottom here, and here's the CPU whose job is gonna be to run in potentially multiple modes of execution. It can run multiple things on top of it, one of which, as we were talking about, is the kernel. So if the CPU is running the kernel, the rules are the kernel should be able to access its own you know, private, sorry, not private, but this like insecure region of memory that it always used to have access to. But it should not be able to touch our nice, you know, shaded, secure memory region. Then we have our monitor here that also should be able to run on the same CPU, but when the monitor is running, the rules are the monitor can touch everything. It can touch the secure memory, it can touch the, public, the sort of insecure memory of the kernel. The monitor needs to touch kernel memory sometimes because they need to be able to communicate, exchange data from one another. Like if the kernel wants to start an enclave, it needs to give the data for the enclave to the monitor, so the monitor needs to be able to get it from the kernel's memory. So the monitor needs access to the whole thing here. And then finally, we have these enclaves running on the side. They're also gonna run on the same CPU, but when an enclave is running, the rules are sort of different again. They only get to access very specific regions, both of secure memory, like here's the secure memory that the enclave can access here, and then here's some pages over here the enclave can access as well. So the enclave has access to some insecure pages. Why do we want to give enclaves access to insecure memory? Isn't this just gonna be asking for trouble? <laughs> the kernel can corrupt it. Yeah. It allows easy communication between the enclaves. Yeah, so if you can only touch, touch this memory, then you're kind of stuck in a little bubble, which is all secure, but useless. Uh, so it's important to allow some form of sharing, so at the very least, if you wanna run Enclave and give it some inputs, like if this Enclave is running some DRM video player, you gotta give it some input video file. It might be encrypted, 
but it's gonna come from somewhere. So the kernel is gonna get it, stick it in this memory, then this enclave is gonna read it out. And similarly, if the enclave gives you something useful you wanna display to the user, well, maybe the enclave can actually stick it in this memory so the kernel can display it or send it out on the network. Um, so it's really for, I think, mostly I.O. from the enclave uh, to the user from the user inputs, outputs, that kind of stuff. Uh, and the API, as we'll talk about, makes a big distinction between this memory and that memory because this is really important. This determines what the enclave is, what code it's running, et cetera. This stuff, you can't really say anything about it other than it sort of exists there and the enclave can read and write it. An enclave code better be written by the developer so that it's not gonna do anything crazy if it discovers any bit sequence whatsoever there. It should like basically not be susceptible to buffer overflows from parsing this input, for example. Uh, bit of a requirement, but uh, nonetheless, maybe you can avoid buffer overflows there. Make sense? All right, so that's the other sort of second thing we really need from our CPU is some way to achieve these three ways of executing code, and we need to be able to transition between them. So the, all these sort of three transitions are possible, so the, in the Komodo design, the kernel is able to invoke calls on the monitor, and this is mostly to set up and tear down enclaves. So if, the, if some process on the kernel wants to start an enclave, the kernel is gonna start talking to the monitor, asking to do things, and then the monitor will start up a new enclave maybe. And then if an enclave is running, it can also make sort of system call-like things, uh, invocations of the monitor as well, to maybe ask for more memory, or to exit, or to send some results back to the kernel, and so on. And these enclaves also, the paper doesn't make a huge deal of this, but I believe the enclaves can also invoke syscalls on the regular kernel. So if an enclave wants to read a file, well, the file is not really trustworthy. It's managed by this malicious operating system. But if you want to do it, the enclave can probably issue a syscall, and it would have to be very careful to put the data for the syscall into this memory that the kernel can actually access. But if the enclave has a plan for what to do with this untrustworthy file, it can ask the kernel to do that. Maybe more likely, it would actually ask the kernel to do network sockets. So the enclave can ask the kernel to connect it to a TCP connection somewhere. Question. So if you had another enclave, could, um the secure memory of the two overlap? So in Komodo's design, and I believe in SGX's design as well, they cannot. So it's okay to share memory here because it's kind of untrustworthy and uh, anything goes. Uh, in Komodo, and I believe in SGX as well, enclaves in here are separate. There's no sharing of memory between enclaves in the secure region. Um, otherwise, not as good of a box. You could imagine different designs, but I believe that's the answer for both SGX and uh, Komodo provides strong isolation by default there. Other questions? All right, so that's the story for uh, what these guys need from the hardware in order to implement their monitor-like functionality. Um, in Komodo, what these guys rely on is a thing called ARM Trust Zone, which is uh, Kind of an interesting extension to the ARM instruction set that x86 doesn't really have an, quite an equivalent as much, uh, where basically the CPU has two modes of operation. There's the normal world and the secure world. Uh, and there's basically a bit in the CPU state that says, I'm currently in normal world, I'm currently in secure world. And that determines, uh, well, should determine which region of memory you're able to read. So if you're in, let's say here, you're in normal world, then you're only allowed to read this normal piece of memory. If you're in this secure world over here, for both the enclaves and the monitor, then the CPU is gonna allow you to read both the regular memory and the secure chunk of memory as well. It's like a special mode of execution. That's almost exactly what these guys need. That helps them a lot. And then they run the monitor in the secure mode of execution on the ARM CPU, and the regular kernel runs in this normal mode. And then in order to isolate the enclave itself to make sure the enclave can't access all the memory but only a subset, they just use page tables again. So that's still available to us. So what they do is they just stick a page table in front of the enclave when it runs. So the page table is gonna control what pieces of memory, either secure or insecure memory, a given enclave can access. So that's gonna look very much like a regular OS kernel except that it's our monitor playing the role of the kernel in setting up this 
page table for the enclave. Make sense? Questions about any of this? Yeah. Charge of the context switches here, because normally the kernel would do this, but like if Yeah. Have... So I think the way to think of it is the monitor is the guy that boots up first. So when you boot up, the bootloader loads the monitor and starts running it in secure mode. And then the monitor is gonna load up the kernel, and when it jumps into the kernel, it tells the hardware, oh, by the way, switch to normal mode right now. So then the kernel is stuck in normal mode. The only thing it can do is issue a trap, which is a special CPU instruction on ARM that gets you back into the monitor in secure mode. And of course, in hardware, in order to make this secure, the hardware has a particular address in the monitor where it'll jump in order to service this interrupt from the kernel into the monitor. So the monitor, sort of to again answer, I think your question, uh, the monitor programs in the hardware so that any traps from the kernel into secure mode go into a particular entry point in the monitor, and then jumps to run the kernel, and you're off and running. Other questions? How this works? Yeah. Page tables live, isn't that Yeah. Oh, good question. Yeah, all these details matter. So in particular, this page table. This thing better live here, right? So this page table, if it lived over here, you'd be in a little bit of a trouble because then it's all good until the kernel goes ahead and changes your page table for you. And then your enclave is very confused about what data it's seeing. Uh, so absolutely, yeah, it's crucial this page table lives here. And actually, even the code of the monitor better live in the secure portion of memory as well. Uh, absolutely. And there's gonna be some data structure we're gonna talk about in a second, this page DB. I'll also better live in the secure portion of memory as well because the monitor is gonna rely on it quite a bit. Got a question over there? How do enclaves get scheduled? Um, so the whole thing, at least in this uh, design, is sequential. So there's one thing running at a time. Uh, there basically it's one, one core, single threaded. So there's no, well, I think there's timer interrupts for, by the OS kernel that you, you can schedule, but basically, the way to think of this world is that the kernel is kind of in charge of the top level of getting stuff done, like actually running something on the CPU. So the kernel is running along. At some time, it might decide, I want to let an enclave run. So at that point, the kernel is going to jump into the monitor, say, hey, why don't you run that enclave? Then the monitor is going to set up the page table and let the enclave run in that page table. When that enclave is done, basically makes a syscall into the monitor saying, I'm done. Or a timer interrupt fire saying, time's up, you've run long enough, then Either you go into the monitor if the enclave gave up voluntarily, or you have an interrupt that goes sort of all the way to the OS kernel, and this enclave gets suspended, and the kernel gets to schedule again. Then this the kernel might decide, oh, let's run a second enclave if there's multiple of them. So one thing that um, maybe I should say is that there's a weird division of labor here. The monitor is trying to be minimal, as we were talking about, so the monitor actually doesn't even know how many enclaves there are or who is running at what, what instant necessarily. The kernel's job is to actually track all this stuff. So the kernel is supposed to know how many enclaves there are, which one should run next, all the stuff, which pages of memory in the secure region are available or not. And the monitor, we're gonna set it up so it just has enough information to decide whether the kernel is doing something ridiculous or it's okay. So the monitor's job is gonna be to like have the minimum amount of data structures to check whether the kernel is doing something allowed or something that could lead to a problem. Question over there, yeah. What are the implications of the cache? Because for example, when you switch back, do, do you load up L1 cache with the data in the enclave? Yeah. yeah, okay, so uh, cache is an interesting question. So there's several answers here. One is that in order to provide the sort of isolated execution, better be the case that the cache is somehow coherent. So when you switch from one world to another, uh, you flush the cache. Or if you don't flush the cache, then the hardware doesn't let you get at the old cache contents at least. Um, so that's the answer, for example, on I believe this ARM trust zone is that, uh, I'm sorry, guarantees that you can't get at uh, old data or at data that you aren't able to access to, even if it's in the cache. Uh, a related point that actually has plagued Intel SGX is that the cache contents could be used as a side channel. So even though, so let's suppose the kernel decides, let me run this enclave for a bit and it runs for a millisecond and comes back to the kernel. If the cache is shared in some way, like capacity is shared, then the kernel can learn, oh, the enclave used five kilobytes of cache space because everything else is still in cache. And that might let you infer some things, 
it's like super subtle attacks. We'll actually talk about this in a couple of weeks after the spring break. But uh, there's attacks that are fairly subtle in terms of timing how long a particular operation takes and what's in the cache. And if you know a lot about what software is running here, like an encryption algorithm, then you might be able to guess like bits of the key based on, oh, do you use a little bit more or less memory? So there are subtle cache issues there as well that show up just because more or less cache space was used. But we'll talk much more about this in a couple of weeks, yeah. Good question? So you said uh, the, uh, the monitor code lives in the secure part of the memory. That's right, yeah. Uh -huh. Like the bootloader is the one that is going to load the, the uh, that's right. So the bootloader is an important part of this whole story for Komodo because in Komodo, the monitor is not baked into the CPU. So the CPU starts running the bootloader and the bootloader has to play in concert with the monitor to get it to the right state because if your bootloader loads the wrong monitor, like a compromised monitor, then we're back where we started. Like the, it's like an OS that's compromised now. So the bootloader is just as much as part of the TCB as the monitor is. Maybe it's less sensitive because the monitor has to deal with all kinds of random malicious inputs from the kernel, whereas the bootloader probably like boots on a nice, clean, quiescent system and just has to get to the right place every time. Uh, so more deterministic, fewer bad inputs that it has to deal with, but also super critical. The bootloader sets up everything correctly. Um, like in particular, the bootloader better put the monitor in the secure mode, not in the normal world, all this stuff. Absolutely. You got a question over there? Secure mode just not used before this paper? It's a complicated story, actually. So here's a, <laughs> it's been around for a long time. It's been used for a long time, and I think it's like still unusable. So what actually happened was that ARM decided, okay, well, we gotta make our processors more secure. So why don't we add an extra mode that's gonna be called secure? Uh, so they added this trust zone thing. They thought it would be great. It could be used for virtual machine monitors, all kinds of stuff. Basically, all the cell phone carriers decided, that's great, we'll put our stuff in the trust zone mode. So on most of the cell phones, up until I think fairly recently, this trust zone mode was taken up by your cell phone carrier software. So they wouldn't actually let the OS do anything useful with this trust zone mode. I think that's changing a bit. Like uh, for example, like Google Pixel and Nexus phones, Google actually does something sensible there because they control this thing. So maybe there's hope to use this feature usefully. But for a long time, it was sort of a cool feature that was just atrophied by the fact that the cell phone carriers got to it first. Um, but it is kind of a, yeah, well, it's been around for, uh, you know, at least 15 years, I want to say, or 20 years-ish, so it's been around for, for quite a while, but, uh, yeah. Questions? Other questions? Yeah? Questions, what part of memory is secure and not secure? I think this is the bootloader's job. So the bootloader probably, uh, like, the way that the CPU is going to isolate different memory portions from one another, is probably a register, a special privilege register in the CPU itself. So when the bootloader boots up, it's gonna tell the CPU, hey, you know, the first one gigabyte is for the monitor. The rest three gigabytes is for the kernel. Go. Uh, and then the CPU is gonna keep them apart. So the bootloader, hugely important job here to set this whole thing up, absolutely. Other questions? Back there, yeah. Uh, on boot, the bootloader checks that the hash of the monitor is correct, right? Um, it depends on where it gets it from. If the monitor is sitting in the same ROM that the bootloader is coming from, maybe it doesn't have to. Uh, if you have a fixed monitor that you're going to run, you could just hash it. If you think the monitor might get upgraded, then the bootloader should probably check a signature so that you can upgrade it over time, all kinds of things like this. Yeah, but uh, that's, something has to happen, absolutely. User, like, presuming that the monitor can be upgraded, right? How do you make sure that the user doesn't supply the road using whatever upgrade? Yeah, you? okay, so um, that's a much better question for Monday's lecture. So this is like a research prototype. These guys have a whole bunch of unanswered questions like this. Monday's lecture is about Apple's iPhones, and they actually answer all these questions because they have like a real device that has to be super secure, and they have like a fairly cool story there, so it'll be easier for me to answer something concrete then than to make up how Komodo might work. <laughs> but absolutely, it's a, yeah. And a, a, a tricky thing is like, how do you prevent downgrades, for example, and all these, uh, yeah, absolutely, yeah, tricky stuff. All right, other questions about sort of mechanics of this execution modes and bootstrapping? All right, so let's try to, uh, let's see. We have time to talk about attestation briefly. Um, so the third thing that this paper does, sort of glosses over, but I think is an important, cool part of Intel's SGX story, 
is this notion of attestation. And the way this works is that uh, I sort of drew out some abstract version of it on the left there, where you have a client talking to this monitor and knowing what is E. But the way this is actually going to work uh, to sort of the next level of detail is that we're going to have our monitor sitting over here. And on top of the monitor, we have the enclaves running. And the monitor is going to have a secret key that's baked into the monitor somehow. Like in Intel CPUs, there's actually like fuses that get burned at manufacture time by Intel that bake in a unique key into each Intel CPU. And this key is going to get used by the monitor, at least in SGX's case, to sign messages about what the enclave is doing. So in order to make this fly, we'll have some client over here that wants to talk to the enclave over the network. It's really over the network, so it can't really talk to the monitor and know what's up. So it's going to talk to the enclave. And what the enclave is going to do is ask the monitor to sign a message about the enclave. So roughly, the shape of this is going to be the monitor generating a signature using its secret key and signing the hash of the enclave. And what it means to sign a hash of the enclave here is, roughly speaking, all the secure portions of the enclave that are actually sort of meaningful. It's not going to bother signing the insecure portions of memory that the enclave has access to because those could have any contents anyway. But any code used by the enclave or any initial data set up by the enclave, where in the memory space it is, all that stuff, that's going to be part of this hash computed by the monitor to describe what's in that enclave box. And then when the client gets this message, sort of, you know, three things have to happen. First, the client better know the public key for the monitor. If the client has no idea what the public key of the monitor is, this signature is meaningless. A second and related thing is that the client has to actually trust the monitor. So if the client knows that public key of that monitor, but it thinks this monitor is garbage, <laughs> it's not much of a consolation that it signed a message. It better think that this is a good monitor. Like, it thinks Komodo is great, and it's going to trust signatures from Komodo monitors. Or it thinks this is an Intel SGX chip, and those guys are well done, it's going to trust it. And the last thing is that for some reason, this client actually knows what hash of the enclave to expect. So the client thinks that, oh, I want to talk to a piece of software running this exact binary. And then when it gets this message from a monitor it trusts whose public key it knows, it can check that, oh, look, I got a message saying I'm talking to someone whose hash is this, and it's signed off by the secret key corresponding to the public key of a monitor I trust. So that's the general attestation story for um, Komodo and for SGX. There's some intermediate machinery that they jump through that doesn't involve public key crypto, but that's not super, I think, interesting at a high level. Uh, questions? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so the thing I, the reason I didn't close this bracket is that uh, there's one more thing you have to send, which is that the signature itself doesn't really tell you much. It just says that somewhere out there in the world, the Sunclave is running. What does it have to do with the guy you're talking to? Is it the same one or not? So in order to line up those things and to sort of connect them together, what you really need is the Enclave to have its own key. So Enclave needs its own Enclave public key and an Enclave secret key. So then what you need to do is to stick the Enclave public key as part of this message. So this message now, the signed message, connects the identity of the Enclave, the hash of its code, to here's a key that only this guy has. And now what's going to happen is that this client gets the signed message, and then it says, well, that's all well and good. Now if I get any other messages from things signed by the corresponding public key, this is the secret key for that, then I really know, ah, that's my Enclave. And the reason that the monitor knows that this thing corresponds to the Sunclave is because this thing is running right there. It can make a monitor call into the monitor saying, I'm running right now. Here's my public key. Trust me. And the monitor knows that that's running right now. <laughs> Make sense? So that's the story for attestation at a high level. Um, some machinery, we can talk about it after lecture if you guys want to come up. But uh, that's the sort of end goal of what attestation is trying to achieve in SGX and in Komodo as well. Question over there. Okay, how the client is able to be sure that it's actually the monitor sending that so, uh, so the 
PK, sorry, so this secret key of the monitor and the public key that the client knows about, that's what convinces the client that it's seeing stuff from the real monitor. And then the EPK and ESK are gonna convince this client that after it sees the signature, it will now start talking to the real enclave because only the real enclave would have the corresponding secret key for the EPK. That's the sort of chain of reasoning. So we'll talk much more actually in like a couple of weeks after, right after spring break on like network protocols and how to reason about this kind of interaction, but hopefully at least the intuition makes some sense. Like you chain these signatures one after the other, you trust this, then you trust that. So. Question? Like, wasn't the uh, secret key, lower key, like created randomly each time? Yeah, so this is, yeah, so, so in Komodo, there's basically an intermediate step. They sort of imagine that, um, they don't want to be in charge of public key crypto. They are thinking they'll run a special enclave whose job is to do this. And the primitive provided by the Komodo monitor is actually a little bit simpler than that. It only allows you to do attestation between enclaves on the same machine. So their idea, and actually kind of how SGX works too to some extent, is that your enclave, if it wants to attest to someone, it first attests locally to a special enclave on the same computer, which has a permanent public secret, public private key pair, identifying that computer, and then that guy is gonna generate a signature for you saying, oh, well, my monitor told me it's you, now I have a secret key, I'll sign off on that. Um, several reasons why to do that, because it's sort of more configurable, you can actually update this special enclave now. Um, yeah, but yeah, the end result is sort of this picture. But there is this intermediate hop that the paper talks about, and I think it simplifies their enclave a bit. Oh, sorry, their monitor is now is a little bit simpler, it doesn't have to do public key crypto. Other questions? All right, so let's talk about sort of maybe two more things. Uh, one is um, how does the monitor actually make sure that it's not misled by the kernel? And then we'll talk about some like potential applications of this stuff. So the way this monitor is gonna get implemented to pro like create enclaves and run them, it's all about pages, so these guys are breaking everything into these four kilobyte chunks of memory stored in this uh, secure region. The reason is because four kilobytes is sort of the natural level at which you can do page table protection, so you can give out four kilobytes to a separate page table if you want. The page table itself is built up of four kilobyte chunks, just like a good unit to manage. You don't have to worry about malloc and fragmentation. And the way the monitor is gonna keep track of what the hell is going on is through this structure called PageDB. And basically this guy, sort of a surprising thing that like, it suffices to just remember what is the type of a page for every page. And there's basically seven types. There's the unused page type, and then there's the six types of used pages that the paper talks about. Uh, so you can have an address space, which is basically like the top level descriptor of an enclave. You could have a thread, which is basically the current register state of a thread and things like that contained in that four kilobytes page. There's the two levels of page tables, L1 and L2 page tables. And then we have just raw data pages and spare pages. So the monitor just has a big array in memory, in its secure memory. For every four kilobytes of memory, it stores one of these seven types for that, ty for that page of memory. And the surprising thing, that turns out to be enough for the monitor to do its job, decide whether the kernel is issuing reasonable calls or not. And as I mentioned before, the OS is actually gonna do all the tracking. The OS actually should know all the stuff about which pages are in what state. It knows where to find the next available page, et cetera. And the monitor is only gonna check that that was an okay thing the kernel told me. Make sense? So the thing I wanna walk through is the creation process, just to give you a flavor of what this PageDB looks like and how it helps us catch issues. So what I wanna draw out here is sort of the sequence of calls from kernel to monitor to create an enclave. So what you can imagine is that some process running on the OS kernel wants to create an enclave. It's gonna ask the kernel, hey, please you know, create an enclave with this elf executable for me. The kernel is gonna issue a whole bunch of calls to the monitor to make this happen. So we can imagine what, what's gonna happen. The first one, uh, they have a whole table of syscalls basically in the paper, which is kind of nice and concrete. 
So the first thing I think the kernel has to do is to call the init address space call, and it has to supply a page for the address space and a page for the level one page table. And the rules for this is that these better be two pages that are marked as unused in the page DB because we're gonna start using them. Otherwise, we're gonna overwrite something that's already used, so it helps us avoid overwriting used memory. And then, if those two pages are indeed unused, then the monitor is actually gonna set them up in its secure memory space where this address space page is gonna be allocated, it's gonna be marked in the page DB as an AS page, and then this guy is gonna, inside of it, have a pointer to the L1 page table, that's sort of the root of the page table for this enclave. Currently, the page table is empty, there's no pages in there, but we're starting to set things up. So there's actually a cool bug that they describe in the paper about that they found in the process of doing formal verification, which is that the code for this init AS call in the monitor used to just check that this is a page that's currently unused, and this is also a page that's currently unused. And they forgot to check that these are two distinct pages. So a malicious kernel could find a free page and pass it in as both the address space page and the L1 page table page. Then the monitor would do all kinds of corruptions you might imagine where it would start writing stuff here as if it was an address space, point to itself as the page table, overwrite its address space contents with page table entries, things would be bad. So this is a bug that they actually discovered in the process of trying to formally prove this kernel monitor correct. Uh, but the design was sound, they just had a bug. So after fixing a bug, this page DB thing, still good. Make sense? So then if you wanna sort of keep going setting up the enclave, then I think you call init L2 to add a second level page table. Uh, so you, again, pass in the address space page and a second level page table that must be free and you say at what virtual address you wanna plug it in. And similarly, the monitor is gonna check that this is indeed of type address space, and this is a free page, and then it's gonna stick it in here, level two page. And then we're gonna actually populate some data here. There's a call map secure that you can give. You could say, well, in this address space page, here's a free data page where you should map this guy at a virtual address, and here's some content to put in there. So what the monitor is gonna do is, of course, check this is a free page, and if so, mark it allocated as a data page and stick it here, so here's some data. And one other thing that actually happens when you start populating actual data in an enclave is that the address space page is gonna have a log of all the things that you've done to build up the enclave. So this log, for example, is gonna say that virtual address got this data, and so on. And this is basically gonna be that hash of the enclave that I showed with the attestation picture. So instead of just like literally reaching up into the enclave and hashing all of its memory at any given time, what actually is gonna happen for attestation is that you record how the enclave was built, and then when you're finished building it, that seals up. That's the identity of the enclave. You built it according to these steps, and that'll let other clients determine what is in that enclave now. Make sense? All right, so if, once you've populated the virtual memory of the enclave with these pages, you can actually create a thread. That turns out to be also part of the important state for the enclave's identity. So in particular, if you have a thread that you wanna create, you give it a thread page and an entry address. And the entry address, this is basically the main function that you'll start running when you jump into the enclave. That's also important to what are you running? Because if you jump in off the wrong point, you're gonna do something different. So the entry point for the thread actually is part of this log as well that'll get hashed to tell the client this is what's running because it started here in this virtual memory layout. And then once you're done, you can actually call this finalize and then you can call enter on a thread and give it some arguments and it'll actually start running. So thread, I guess I forgot to draw it here, will be another page. When you create the thread, it sets up the thread with a pointer to the address space. And then when you run it, it checks that you gave it a real thread thing according to the page DB. And if it's a thread, then it's safe for the monitor to look up what address space it points to and so on and start running a thread like a regular OS kernel would. Make sense? So that's sort of this page DB machinery that allows the monitor to 
guard itself from the OS doing something nonsensical, like I guess the bug they described is if the OS tries to confuse the monitor in terms of which pages to use for what data structures. And the page GB turns out to be sufficient to guard against all this stuff. Any questions there? All right, so the last thing I wanna talk about is actually what this stuff is good for. It's a little bit hard to tell. Um, it's fairly early days. I think this uh, Enclave ma machinery has been around for you know, a couple of years, but no killer apps yet. Uh, as we mentioned really early in this lecture, DRM was sort of one of the initial drivers for the predecessors of this Enclave machinery. Uh, it's still around there, but it's kind of a not super exciting, and I think not really working out as, as much as an application. Um, the most exciting use case I know for Enclaves is actually sort of a clever thing that the signal messaging system does. Um, so let me sketch out for you how signal servers use Enclaves uh, to actually achieve something like cool security-wise. Um, so if you guys haven't actually used this, so signal is a, basically a text messaging system of some sort. Uh, one problem they have is contact discovery. So contact discovery, what I mean by this, or what they mean by this, is that you got a new user that uses Signal, they wanna figure out which of their buddies is also on Signal so they can chat there. So on your cell phone, you got your address book of all your buddies' phone numbers, and the Signal server has a list of all their users. So here we have the server on the right, and somewhere there's a database. There's like a phone number of a Signal user, here's another phone number, large database, probably sensitive, and on your cell phone, you're running your the Signal app that does text messaging for you, and you also have your address book of basically all, all your friends' phone numbers. And the way this contact discovery used to work before SGX came along uh, was that the Signal app on, on your phone would uh, basically have to take your address book and ship it to the server wholesale, and the server would look through its database and say, well, that's cool, you got an address book of these 100 buddies, uh, these 20 I see in my database, here they are. And this is how contact discovery used to work in Signal and pretty much every other messaging app. Uh, you would just send your phone book to the server and the server would look through it and tell you what the answer was. Not super desirable because if the server is compromised or if the operators are not trustworthy or if some government subpoenas the server, like they wanna know who Franz's you know, phone book records are, they'll just tell the servers, you gotta record when this RPC comes in. Um, so maybe undesirable. The other design is also undesirable. Like if you send this whole database to the phone, good for me, maybe except that I'm downloading a lot of data, but bad for everyone else's privacy because now I have a list of all the Signal users. So the thing that Signal does, actually kind of clever using attestation, what they do is actually they create an enclave with basically a fairly straightforward piece of software whose job is to just maintain this big database of all the phone numbers and allow requests that check whether a given phone number is in this database. So there's some program that sits inside of this enclave and only it has access to all these uh, incoming requests. The phone numbers, I guess all the signal servers know, that's not a secret to the servers, but the secret stuff we wanna keep private is my phone book when it's shipped to the servers. So the way Signal works is actually the first thing happens when I connect to this contact discovery service, when my app connects, is that the contact discovery service sends me an attestation. Basically, it's a signature by the secret key of the Intel chip running some Signal server in the data center saying that it's actually running the hash of this program and some key that's gonna let me talk to this program. And the Signal app that I run on my phone knows this is exactly, there's only one hash of the approved contact discovery program on the server side that it should accept. So it's basically a baked in hash in the client on your Signal app. And if it gets an attestation from the server saying, I'm running this hash, this exact program, then it knows it's okay to trust this guy. And then it sends your address book to this uh, enclave on the server encrypted with whatever the secret key is of that enclave. And the cool thing here is that, and of course now that enclave can process your data, send you the results back. The cool thing is you're no longer trusting the operators of the server or the OS kernel running on this machine. So even if that server is completely compromised or if some government gives you a subpoena 
You gotta like take the server and like watch all the requests. Nothing you can do. You gotta really like the TCB here is Intel. Like you'd really have to go to Intel and tell Intel to give up its SGX key or something like that in order to compromise the system now. So there's still you know not 100% guarantee, of course, nothing is. But you've really raised the bar here uh, from arbitrary code running on the server, being able to look at all the requests to really having to get Intel in on compromising these contact discovery queries. So this is probably the coolest use of SGX that I know of offhand. Uh, there's other things like DRM and some like password manager stuff that seems less fully baked yet. But I guess the summary is that this is really a fairly cutting edge isolation technology still being developed some really cool use cases that you could use because it really addresses a strong threat model that's pretty crazy hard if you try to think of it sort of upfront, but uh, also important because indeed many of our OSs are indeed compromised. All right, so that's it for SGX. See you guys on Monday, we'll talk about iPhone security.